Welcome back. Nashville, Tennessee is the heart of the world's country music scene. It's where you'll find the Grand Ole Opry and a slew of country music's top stars. It's also home to a humble Canadian who for years has written some of the best known country hits. His name is Gordy Sampson. W5's Derek Miller follows him from Music City all the way to his hometown in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia to find the secret to writing a hit song. Nashville, Tennessee Strip is a study in country music cliches, beer, tractors, and cowboy boots that have never set foot in a barn. Saccharine cowgirls and weekend cowboys celebrating birthdays or the last days of single life above the live twang of country music. It sounds like St. Patrick's Day here, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's like there's ba every band's playing everywhere. It's kind of St. Patrick's Day every day here. <laughs> Gordy Sampson is a Canadian who's lived in Nashville for 17 years. And like the dozens of storefront entertainers here, he's a musician. Who are the people playing these gigs? Are they just local folks or are these people who are chasing the dream? There are a lot of people that are chasing the dream. Chasing fame and playing cover songs. Gordy sings a few of those songs himself. But when he sings them, they're not cover songs because he wrote them. Songs recorded by dozens of music stars. Luke Bryan, Keith Urban, Faith Hill, even the Backstreet Boys. No one's ever gonna love you more than God, your mama and me. Do you remember the first time that you heard one of your songs on the radio sung by somebody else? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, when you hear that song on the radio, it was like, I mean, it was like, really incredible. Gordy isn't traditionally famous, but he's world famous among country music stars. People across the United States and Canada, for the most part, don't know the name Gordy Sampson. But you know the name Gordy Sampson. Yeah. Like country yeah. superstar, Carrie Underwood. He wrote one of my um, absolute biggest hits. So I'm very thankful that I know the name Gordy Sampson. Jesus, take the Jesus Take the Wheel was Underwood's very first number one hit. It's one of several Gordy's co-written for her. And oh yeah, he won a Grammy Award. There's a, a certain way to write in country music where you want to be very relatable, but you want your lyrics to really mean something as well. And I feel like he just walks all the lines perfectly in the songs that I've recorded from, from him that he was a writer on. If you think Carrie Underwood loves Gordy because he wrote her a number one song, it's way more than that. He's actually was a writer on one of my favorite songs. It wasn't a single, but it's one of my absolute favorite songs called Someday When I Stop Loving You. I remember that night we laid in bed, naming all our kids that we hadn't had yet. And I just think it's just beautifully written, and that's just, that's what it's all about. Willie Nelson recorded a couple of your songs. Yeah. What's it feel like for Will Willie Nelson, a living legend, literally a living legend? When you hear your song sung with that voice, even at the age of 86, which in the, my case it was, it's breathtaking. It's absolutely tear-inducing. My favorite picture of you is the one where you're staring straight into the lens. New artists are kind of lucky to have your song. <laughs> Willie Nelson is different. I'm really lucky that Willie sang mine. This place is about as big as my house, by the way. <laughs> Gordy lives well off the Nashville Strip in a leafy green community with a backyard studio. This is almost like a museum here, like a wall of fame here. This is a million copies sold. This is a gold record. Two million copies sold. Like, do you ever take a moment and just say, wow, do you do that? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. it never gets lost on me. And here I need to admit a bit of a conflict of interest. Gordy and I grew up together. That's him, 
That's me. We were 13 and the future was still blurry. This is a reunion of sorts. It's been close to 30 years since I last saw him. Pick that up. I want you to play that. The banjo? The banjo, yeah. I have no business playing the banjo. That's why I want to hear it. This is not even in tune. Anyway, yeah. It's Nashville. If you want a banjo, get a banjo guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember about Gordy. He could play anything. And this, of course, is a very, very important spot. Yeah. That's a Grammy. Yeah. That's the Grammy. Yes. Can I touch it? Yeah. So that was... There's our... dust on it. Are you allowed to have dust on it? <laughs> You're See? allowed to have a little bit of dust on it. Yeah. OK, all right, yeah. a little bit. That was for Jesus Take the Wheel. How does your life change when you win a Grammy? The first way it changed was, it was at the border. You know, be like, what do you mean you're going down here to write songs? Do you make money? You know, the border guards couldn't really reconcile how that worked. And I'd be searched. As soon as I have the song, they're like, what do you, what do you mean you're going to Nashville? What songs? It's like, well, I, I wrote that Jesus Take the Wheel song. And they instantly be like, my mother loves that song. Like, or whatever. <laughs> go through. <laughs> like, go ahead. It's been a steep journey to Grammy Award winning songwriter. Samson grew up in a tiny community in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Big Pond is <clears throat> small, population 194. No gas station, store, or post office. But it has musical cred. It's a work on man I am. Big Pond was also home to maritime royalty, Rita McNeil. Gordy grew up surrounded by music. His mother was a professional musician, playing keyboards in a cover band. But Gordy didn't start out as a precocious performer. I do remember the first time I performed something at the house when mom and dad had people over. I think Rita was there, Rita McNeil. I played something on the piano, and everybody clapped and made loud noises afterwards. And I started crying, because I didn't know what the loud noises were. How old were you? I was probably like five. Performing was Gordy's dream, and for a while, he lived that dream, playing lead guitar in a maritime pop band. Then, in the mid-90s, Gordy joined controversial, hard-living, and sometimes unpredictable rock fiddler Ashley McIsaac. Actually, my first number one song was an Ashley song, and it's in Gaelic. I wrote that with Ashley and Mary Jane Lamond, a Gaelic singer. Sleepy Maggie? Sleepy Maggie. If you're writing in English, you just say the idea and try to rhyme with it, but there's an extra step, right? You have to say the idea. It's like, OK, what does that sound like? in Gaelic. How's your Gaelic? Oh, un petit peu. That's French. <laughs> Sorry. Gracias. <laughs> Can you say anything in Gaelic? Do you remember? Just anything? dirty stuff. <laughs> well, life on the road with Ashley McIsaac was chaotic and exhausting. And after a year or so, Gordy quit. And then I started playing with Rita McNeil. They're both Cape Breton acts, but I'm sure you could appreciate that. There's a spectrum, and it, Ashley it McIsaac's from, here, and, and Rita McNeil is here. Yes, it went from absolutely mad, making no money, to absolutely chill, making good money for the first time in my life. In Cape Breton, playing in Rita McNeil's band was the definition of making it. But then Gordy released his own pop albums and discovered something big. I discovered songwriting. I was like, hey, wait a second. You don't have to move to do this as a living. So You can uh, still create. I can create, and I can still play all my guitars and, and perform. That's where it gets really fun. The thing that impresses me about Gordy's writing is that he doesn't seem to be afraid of taking chances, taking risks with songs, writing about topics that are difficult. Tom Rowland is a writer for Billboard magazine here in Nashville. He'll write about death and alcohol, you know, accidents and religion. That's Dangerous ground yeah. sometimes. Especially if you're thinking commercially. So to go ahead and do that anyway is, is uh, it's bold and it's also smart. There's this thing we say called dare to suck. Dare to suck. Dare to suck, which means be fearless, accept that 
It's like, hey, I got an idea for the second line. What if we said this? And you're kind of accepting that for every 10 things I say, nine of them are, I'm going to look like an idiot, and one of them's going to be right. It's amazing how you can be oblivious to how good or bad your songs are. So every week, I write a song that I that I'm like, I can't wait for my publisher to hear this. They're going to freak when they hear this or whatever. And I turn it in and they're like, cool song, bro. Or whatever, right? They friend zone your song. Yeah. And conversely, they'll call you the next day and say, so-and-so just cut your song yesterday and they're going to radio with it. It's going to be her next single or his next single. And you're like, that whole thing? That's, that sucks. <laughs> Coming up. Well, hello there, my son. Coming home to find inspiration when W5 continues. Gordy Sampson is a Canadian country songwriter who writes with a magic touch. He's written hits for dozens of artists, such as Carrie Underwood, Willie Nelson, and the Backstreet Boys. These days, Gordy spends a lot of time with Dylan Guthrow. Guthrow is a songwriter who's also from Nova Scotia. What's the actual lyric? We're only breaking up to get to the making up to get to, to, get the... to the breaking up all over again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of words for a song about nothing. <laughs> Dylan just moved to Nashville, something he may not have even tried without Gordy. Gordy's been here for 17, 18 years. You're relatively new in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Is it a comfort blanket to have him here? It, it can be create a little bit of a home space for you? Absolutely, yep. Well, seeing him do it, first of all, you know, open the doors in my head to, to know that it's possible. Here we go. What's first? Like, do you start with an idea of a song, or do you start with like a title? Like, how does this process work? You can lose a shirt off your back on a blackjack table. There's kind of a tradition of starting with the title that a lot of writers adhere to. It's not the only way to do it, but I do it almost all the time. You can kind of start with anything some days. You can have a title that's just a silly word, and you can spin it into something meaningful. To be a loser. Dylan gets regular one-on-one -on -one access to Gordy. Yeah, dude. But he's not the only musician who Gordy has mentored. So Song Camp was an idea that was born on a plane ride that Sherry Jones and I took from Toronto to Halifax. For 10 years, he gave back to the community that raised him, hosting the Song Camp in Cape Breton, a boot camp for songwriters that helped launch the careers of some while sharpening the confidence of others. But there's one musician he's helped create, one for which he has a very special vested interest. Amelie is 19 and Gordy's daughter. Any dad that has a daughter that's really good at something, it's hard to be objective because they're your flesh and blood, but She's incredible. Going to work in tall buildings. It's lovely, and we're just like, okay, let's get behind this 100% and, and do it, you know? Maybe just a tad up, and we should be good. For fans of songwriters, this is like the Vatican or Mecca. This is the legendary Bluebird Cafe, a live Nashville venue where hundreds of musical greats including sometimes obscure writers, share their secrets. So Willie recorded this on his Band of Brothers record. And uh, it's a, a nutty little song that Bill Anderson and I wrote about being songwriters. And it's called Songwriters. The crowd is made up of music connoisseurs, musicians, and super fans eager to hear what inspired a hit song. That's their favorite part of the night. They enjoy, it's like, I didn't know they wrote that because of that. There's always some little story, some little funny thing about every song, right? You we're heroes and schemers. We're jokes and we're dreamers. We're lovers and sometimes we're fighters. We're the students, we're the teachers. We're devils and we're preachers. We're true love, but mostly one-nighters. 
with the songwriters. Gordy shares the stage with singer-songwriter Emily Falvey and Troy Burgess, who's written dozens of hits while collecting both Grammy and Oscar nominations. Pretty good company for Dylan Guthrow's Bluebird debut, another door that Gordy Sampson helped open, giving Dylan a chance to shine. I was kind of bored, and one of my hobbies became texting exes after drinks. <laughs> When you're not in front of a real instrument with strings on it, this is your instrument. This is your workspace. Yeah, this is uh, the position I'm in most of the time, <laughs> actually, right here. Sometimes the songs Gordy writes are with the artist. Sometimes he's a bit of a salesman. So this is an example of a pitch song. What that means, essentially, is we didn't write this with the artist. We're pitching the song to an artist, as opposed to writing the song with them. Soon as I'm out of it, I stumble back into it. Thought I was through with it, but I guess I'm only Gordy writes about 120 songs a year. Between 10 and 25% are actually recorded by someone. A pretty good ratio. How do you keep the creative freshness to this? Because it's a job, after all. Yeah. How do you stop it from becoming mundane? It's really hard. I guarantee if somebody came into my life and said, I want you to write all five days a week, song a day, the songs will start to become sheer and sheer. What happens, too, is you write every day, you have nothing to write about, right? Like, you have to take a day off, you have to go out in the country, drive down a back road, whatever your thing is. If you're constantly writing, what do you write about? This is how Gordy Sampson finds things to write about. Every year, for 17 years, he and his family leave Nashville for a three-day drive back to Cape Breton, where he stays for two months. I've never not come home, and I, I, I don't think I ever will not come home. Hello, Mom. Well, hello there, my right. son. Gordy's first musical influencer is his mother, Flo. You nice to see you. She still lives in Big Pond, and at age 74, her fingers haven't lost a beat. At the age of two, I bought him a small little beginner guitar just so he could have it on the floor. At two years old? Two years old, I just threw it down on the floor so he would pick it up, bang, end of the guitar. <laughs> when Gordy was a kid, I often say that we thought he was upstairs trying to sleep, and he was listening probably to every note we were playing. So we would find him some night sitting at the top of the stairs so he could get closer to what was going on. When you have a musical mom and a Grammy Award in Cape Breton, this happens a lot. Although Gordy discovered Celtic music late in life, and his mother's specialty was pop songs, the two of them can still rock out a traditional Nova Scotia Cayley. Do you ever get song ideas just from parties like this, just from overhearing conversations, yeah. gossip, that kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. This is cool, Derek. You might appreciate this. Oh, this like a, a lyric book? Yeah. So when I had the idea for Jesus to Take the Wheel. This is actually this is the me. genesis of Jesus Take the Wheel. It is, yeah. This is me like writing it down sort of in an attempt to capture what kind of went through my brain. My co-editors in Nashville completely were like, yeah, that's cool, but what if we did this? And I was like, oh, that's so much better. Take care of that. I think it needs to be framed or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I will do that. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't look like anyone's been in here for a long time. Yeah, it looks a little run down now for sure. The school that Gordy and I went to closed down a few years ago. There simply aren't enough kids in the area to keep it open. This is where uh, the tough kids used to hang out. Yeah. It's the kids that smoked. Yeah, right. Sometimes I'd kind of stand off to the side a little bit because yeah. I was wanted to be close to them, but I was kind you of afraid. You wanted to look cool. I was kind of afraid of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I get it. 
I think yep. I stashed some weed in the middle class where it's probably still in there if we yeah. can get in. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most of the kids we went to school with 30 some years ago moved away, just like Gordy. And just like Gordy, more and more come back in the summer. In Gordy's case, he puts it in writing. I'm very emotionally invested in Cape Breton. Every time I sign a publishing deal, I make sure they know that unlike a lot of your other writers that write 125 songs a year, I'll try to write you 125, but I'm gonna do them between August and June, and then I'm gonna split for a couple of months. Are we cool? And they're like, yeah, man, however you wanna do it. You know, I'll be writing songs, I'll be in Nashville, and by the time March comes, I mean, I'm counting down the days till June or whenever when the Fam Jam and I get in a truck and haul ass home to Cape Breton. I brought something. Yeah. We're reminiscing about old school days. Well, I dug out my Come yearbook on. and I looked through it. You are kidding me. I looked through it and you didn't sign it anywhere. I was hoping that maybe you'd sign my yearbook. I will be happy to 30 years later. <laughs> Derek, my man, I'm sorry I got all the girls in junior high. Hope you don't hold it against me. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Sorry I'm like 30 years late or whatever. Cheap way to get an autograph, I know, but he is my only friend with a Grammy. <laughs> I didn't sign yours either. I feel bad about it, though. <laughs> Gordy just signed a deal with Sheltered Music. That's a new publishing company whose writers include country legends Emmylou Harris and Marty Stewart. 